He's a professor emeritus of urban design with the School of Architecture in Copenhagen, Denmark, and a founding partner of Gale Associates. As well, he is a very, very reflective practitioner and an author, having written books such as Life Between Buildings, Public Spaces, Public Life, and the most recent book, Cities for People. This time we're talking about eco-cities and uh, I'll just make the point that you can make endless green buildings in a city, it could still be absolutely black and, and you have to make a much more holistic approach to, to ecology than just taking any particular little bit out. So sustainable cities, they are very fine, but my point today is that if we make cities for people, if we focus on making livable cities, they will, be, they will be able to do more, including the sustainable bit. Making cities for people, and I'm mainly pointing at making great cities for people who walk and people who bicycle, then you will have a more lively, more attractive, more safe, more sustainable, and more healthy city. And in this way, we can hit five birds with one stone instead of just one. Sorry for the birds. I'll tell you in the beginning here, I'll tell you about, I made a, tour, a trip to Hanoi, where I was to speak in relation with Danish Embassy, and there was a Vietnamese lady, this Mrs. Khan here. She was a wonderful lady. She's been in Copenhagen, and she said, gee, you must have in Copenhagen a baby boom, because when she was in Copenhagen, she saw children all over the place. And here is, so of course, something about the relationship between merchandise and baby boom, but that's another story. <laughs> but then I started to realize, yeah, in Copenhagen, we have children all over the city. This whole city fabric is permeated by children. They are wheeled around everywhere. 30% of all the families who have children in Copenhagen have a cargo bike to bring them to school and to kindergarten or just bring them around, and they love it. And every bike can take one, two, or sometimes three kids, and they do. In Denmark, all the kids start to bicycle as early as they ever can, and they do it with great determination. They, they know it's the gates to life and to mobility, and they are proud as peacocks when they can master the intricacies of bicycling. These are some fellows there. And then they can start to go biking to work, and the, to, to school, and they can bike in all directions. You will see a lot of bicycle children. Also, you will see a lot of children in Copenhagen being transported in other ways in great numbers. It has a little bit to do with the long maternity leave, but anyway, there are children on the street. I came to realize all this, that we have a city where we never, where it's always a good idea to bring the kids out with you in the city. And to me, when I thought about it, that was really a sign of quality that children could be part of the street scene and the city scene all over the city. Also, if we talk about walking, there is quite a few things which makes it better for children. We have not come to this yet, but we are pretty close. Most of the streets in Copenhagen have in the past 10 years been transformed from asphalt from wall to wall to very uh, complete streets with one lane in either direction with street trees, with bicycle lanes, and with a good median so it's much safer to cross the street. And whenever we have a side street, we will inevitably take the sidewalk across the side street and the bicycle lane across the side street just to show the pedestrians and the bicycles that they're just as much worse as the bugger who comes in a car from the side street. And I never thought about this, but then my daughter said one day, isn't it fantastic now? Because now Laura, who is seven, she can now walk to school because she can walk on the bicycle all the way, on the, on, the, on the sidewalk all the way. And that, of course, is correct. If you can walk on the sidewalk, you're much safer. So here we have not children negotiating three streets, 
with cars negotiating three sidewalks. And that's a fantastic difference from a child. So my point really is make cities where you can have the children all over and you have a good people city and that will be good for most of the other things also. And that is in, in Hanoi, they have many more children. And the more I thought about it and walked around and moved around, I realized that children were all the time taken away from the street scene. They were by their par grandparents. They were hidden. They could not be out. It was polluted. It was bloody dangerous. And so here we have one city among many, many others in the world where part of the population cannot at all use the city because it's too dangerous and too unpleasant. So my point is that it is a very good policy all over the world to make people-oriented cities where you can walk and you can bicycle. And that will actually address five of the very important points in 21st century. I have mentioned them already. I can just go, um, I just mentioned them. And you have all this livability, attractivity. It can becomes more safe. It becomes more sustainable and more healthy. There's a lot of things I'll not talk about today. When I was here last talking about my new book, I talk about the change of paradigm, the awful change of paradigm around 1960, when the modernists started to come into fall, when we started to plonk down buildings from great height. I called it the Brasilia syndrome, where you, it looks fine from the aeroplane, but down at eye level, uh, there was nothing to talk about. That was the time when we gave the transport, the, the um, the transport planners and the um, transport tra traffic engineers, they were given all the eye level planning to do instead of people doing it for people. Traffic engineers were doing it for cars and we have all these awful environments which we have still, this I'm not going to talk about. And I'm not going to talk about the other awful paradigm which happened at that time, the car invasion where all our communities were invaded by cars and ever, that, ever since that time, we have been completely confused and think that the major thing to do in cities is to make the cars happy. And we've got numb about the loss of quality which has happened. And we've seen that the traffic engineers are out there organizing the smallest potholes while people are struggling to survive in our urban environments. And mind you, it's even worse in Romania. They got the cars later, but they got many more. And now they think that the freedom from communism is the right to park everywhere and drive everywhere. Now, 30 years, 50 years after, we have definitely some new shift of paradigm. Because now we are increasingly going after um, a city for people, or rather a city which will address the lively, attractive, safe, sustainable, and healthy issue in a holistic way. I will not have time to tell about why all this should happen, but there is increasingly a demand for a livable city. Um, and of course, if we make cities for people, they become more attractive, better scale, less noise, less stress, and they will be dominated by attraction number one, which is other people it always were. The cities will be more safe because more people will use the public spaces and that will be a safety factor of great importance. And they will be more sustainable. The more we walk and the more we bicycle, the better. But also good public realm is a precondition for good public transportation because you have to walk or bike to the mean of, of transportation. So um, good people city and good uh, public transportation are brothers and sisters. And of course, we've had this new challenge of healthy city. And we know now that half an hour of exercise, of moderate exercise in the morning and in the evening, one hour a day, that will give us an average lifetime, which is seven years longer. And more importantly, it will give us much less health costs in the society. So that is the cheapest policy of all of them. That is to invite people to walk and bicycle naturally as course of their daily day life. 
instead of expecting them to take the escalator and do the fitness center. This had been used for a number of years. It works for a few years in the middle of your life, but all the rest of the life you haven't got the time and the inclination. It's much better if you bicycle and walk because that is the obvious thing to do. So my suggestion for a very simple city improvement policy is a, a policy which they have adopted in many cities by now. In this city, we'll do everything to invite people to walk and bicycle as much as possible in the course of their daily day doings. The key word is inviting. It's not something about forcing them, but making it obvious that this is the smarter. I will not talk about Copenhagen today. I'll not talk about how in Copenhagen for 50 years ago they started to push the cars back and celebrate pedestrians. They've done it ever since. They've done it in 50 years now. I will not talk about how there are many, many more people walking. And I'll not talk about how much time we spend in the streets now and, and um, how the season actually, how we got rid of winter in no time because in the beginning, we could not have sidewalk cafes. Now they are out for, for 10 months a year. And everything is done to prolong the good season. And now we have the smoking laws. So now the good season is around the year. And we have no winter, no more. We, I could tell you a lot about city for walking. And Copenhagen could be an example. I haven't got time. I'll could tell you about a nice city for bicycling, and Copenhagen could be an example, but I'll not talk about that. Uh, that is what I'm not talking about. I'll not talk about how they, over the time, have made a complete city-wide network of proper bicycle lanes. I'll not talk about how this is now a complete, efficient transportation network. I'll not talk about the importance of making bicycling safe and showing the bicyclists that they are loved, making good bicycle intersections and, and crossing street crossings, having street lights coming on, and the importance of having bicycling and the other modes of traffic integrated so that the taxis will naturally take two bikes and that you can bring your bike in the train at any time for free and that the metro will take your bike. And of course, I'm not time today to talk about that bicycling is by now in Copenhagen it's a lifestyle. Everybody bikes. The mayor arrives in the city hall on bike every day. The politicians arrive. Everybody uses bicycles. Even the best players use bicycles. And the more progressive companies have bicycle helmets for their <laughs> employees. And everybody bikes. Even the crown princess has been found to bike his little kid who is half Australian, and that shows that Australians can learn to bike if they start early. <laughs> so what have you seen? I'm not going to talk about this, but bicycling has doubled. The more you invite, the more there are, if you're serious with the invitation. 37% now use bicycle to go to work, and 70% continue during the winter. Copenhagen now has a goal that it will be bicycle city number one in the world, and they will be, want to have 50% bicycling by 2015. I could stop here, and I'm not going to talk about it anyway. But we have problems also. Now the major problem in Copenhagen is the awful congestion on the bicycle lanes. So it has been decided that something should be done about it. We must take more asphalt from the cars, because there are so many people who want to bicycle that the bicycle lanes are not big enough. So now they have an intermediate program of doubling the bicycle lanes by just moving the, the lines further out. And on some of the major streets, you can see 36,000 bicycles every day. This is from this winter. And now we have a new situation, but now they are after the intermediate bicycle lanes, they are just doubling the bicycle lanes proper with curb on either side. So, and all the time they're taking the room from the automobiles because if there's enough bicycles, it's much better economy in a city to give the room for the bicycles and take the parking and whatever the cars out. We are even more desperate now. So now they made a system of, of bicycle highways where you can, which will be sort of highways supporting the network. We are putting bicycle bridges 
all over the city so that it could be easier to get around. And the awful parking problem of the cargo bike is being solved now by plastic cars where you can put four cargo bikes in one parking spot, um, which will give parking for 12 people instead of one. So I could stop here, and I'm not talking about this anyway, but I'll just show you that things are going on. The latest thing happening in 2011 is they realized there's not enough room in the trains for all the bikes, so they have now doubled the train, the, the bicycle space in the trains. And just the other day I picked up this one, which is a strategy from 211, that Copenhagen wants to go from being rather good to being absolutely best in the world. So they have a strategy, they know where they will go. It's been a fantastic success to go for the bicycles. I'm not going to talk about it. But they will have A, a bicycle routes and B bicycle routes, and they will do a number of bridges and tunnels and whatever, ferry boats. And this is a predicted increase in bicycle streams by 2025. That's what we are not going to talk about. Certainly I'll not talk about Melbourne, which, where we have worked, but, and where we've seen a fantastic increase in the number of people walking based on the fact that they have widened, or they really had a policy in this city, we walk and we bike. They have revived the city fabulously. It's one of the best cities in the world by now, Melbourne. Who would have thought that? They are also full speed into introducing Copenhagen style bicycle lanes in Melbourne. And what's a Copenhagen style bicycle lane? That is a bicycle lane, as you can see on the left, where the parked cars protect the bicycles. They are doing that in Melbourne. The other system where you use the bicycle to protect the parked cars, you can study just outside here on the way over to the hotel. And that is not a place where you send four-year-old children to school. So if you want to have a system which is for everyone, you better make it safe and better use the parked cars to protect the bicycles. It's just to arrange with a painter to come one morning and shift the line, and you are fine. Do it. We could talk about Sydney, and Sydney is great in many ways, but certainly uh, it's getting better and better. They again have a policy in this city, we'll walk and bike as much as possible. They are full speed putting in a bicycle system now, and all over the city are signs of heavy activity. I'm not either going to talk about New York, which is one of my favorites. All these cities we have worked in and advised them and helped them with the strategies. Here we had this fantastic strategy by uh, Mayor Bloomberg that there should be no commuting into New York. Everybody should either go by subway or go by bicycle or go by or walk and not go much into the details. But they have this plan and they are pouring out bicycle lanes in a fabulous tempo. They started in 2007 and they've done 800, no, 600 um, kilometers by now in all the boroughs of New York and the bicycle ridership is moving up. Also, they decided that it could be much better for all the people who walk around in New York and then they have widened the sidewalks and they have especially um, treated Broadway. Uh, this, and, and in the end, it came so far that they decided that they needed some good public spaces where all the people gathered in New York anyway. And that was in Herald Square. That was last year. And um, it was in Times Square. So Broadway is now closed at the two most important places. And new public spaces are being put up in all the other intersections of Broadway. Broadway is widened, sidewalk is widened, bicycle lake, lane, the whole length of it. And I could, on another day, end here by singing with, I think it's Frank Sinatra, when you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. And I can also tell you that the shops who are in those areas which have been so treated, they are now, three years later, selling 71% more. They have 71% more turnover. People love places where they can be left in peace and enjoy the city rather than try to escape the traffic. No, 
what I really am going to talk about today, and that should sort of sum up my idea, make the city for people and you will solve a lot of other problems. That is the city of Christchurch in New Zealand, a wonderful city of 350,000 inhabitants with a very famous city plan which is modeled after Adelaide, Savannah, Philadelphia, and basically or originally the new town in Edinburgh, a fine city with a fine river going through it. It has in the last year, half year, been devastated by two fantastic, devastating earthquakes. And here you can see a picture of the city seconds after the second earthquake, which hit right under the city center and completely destroyed the central district. Um, it has been the privilege of myself and my team to be invited by the city of Christchurch to come and help them. And the task was this, that they were not going to rebuild the city. After these two quakes, people were very, very in, in doubt about whether they should stay in the city, whether it would ever be worth living there. And so it was decided they could not move the city. It was far too much investment done in this place. And you can make uh, earthquake proofs uh, uh, buildings nowadays. And so you could reconstruct the city, but they realized they should promise a city which was much better. They should actually promise one of the best cities for the first 21st century. And as the mayor said, this is our chance to get rid of the poor compromises of the 20th century. Now we have a, a cleared table. We can do the right thing from the beginning. And here are some views of the city, and it's really humbling to see this fantastic uh, devastation, which is all over the city. And here you can see the cathedral before and the cathedral after. And Gale Architects was already employed by the city of Christchurch before. You can see this report from 2009, where we were employed to come with strategy for improving the city. And then when the earthquake happened, the mayor at once came and said, now, for God's sake, now we knew the, need the improvements more than ever. Come and help us. So we have had a gang of various size down there working with the city council planners as an integrated team. It's not about one firm and the other firm. It's about a teamwork where everybody has been, has been working together. The interesting process has been involved because they've invited the entire community to come forward with ideas of how they can make a better city. They've had 106,000 ideas coming in. And here's, here are part of the process. And here is what the people ask for. And to me, that is very interesting. The blobs over there is the size of the number of demands. And you can see that the, the really big blobs are, they want a green city, they want a city with people, they want um, cafes and refreshments and safety and whatever, bicycling, and very low on the list is parking and, and driving, actually. And if you go into the, the wording, the city full of people, a destination with exciting things to do, uh, full of green and inviting spaces, easy to get around and to walk around, low rise with safe, sustainable buildings that look good and function well, walkway, cycleway, lanes, whatever. Here are the, the five major principles which came out of this policy. And to me, the interesting thing is what the people ask for are more or less very close to what a people city would look like. And that is very different from what the developers ask for or what the, some of the city councillors ask for. But here is the new plan. The city should be a green city, much more green. It should have a stronger identity. So instead of having high rise here and there as the developers thought best, they want a distinct compact city where the pu public monuments are the ones sticking up. 
They want a more compact and more complex central business district. Instead of having all this traffic and using the streets for parking, they want to have the streets very minimal, much more oriented toward life, work, play, and learn. And then they want an accessible city with green mobility. One of the important things is that they, they have done away with the high rise. They thought the high rise were not making their city more beautiful. It was making some developers more wealthy. And, but they could have a better city without high rise. And you say, could you have a good city without high rise? What about Barcelona? What about Washington DC? What about Paris? What about Venice? What about Vienna? What about Copenhagen? They're not too bad or Edinburgh. So you can easily have a wonderful city and you can have a much stronger identity. Here are some of the things about if you have high rise, you have a number of things. You have shades, you have wind, you have overpowering and uh, you cannot from the high rise see what's going on in the city. And maybe the final thing, if there is a need to evacuate the house, it takes a bloody long time to get down from the tent store. And the whole idea of health was also in here, that if we have lower houses, we can walk up and down, and we can still have a lift for the babies and the olds, but much more walking on stairs would be done in lower houses than it will ever be done in higher houses. So let's keep this. Um, so this is what it might look in the future in, in Christchurch. And here is a block sort of a, a fantasy block designed. Uh, the idea is much, change, much mixture of functions. And we even are so proud that it has come into the cartoon in the newspaper. L I love this safer low-rise plan. What is the scale? Oh, the scale is actual scale. So this is what the streets may look like. They will use the opportunity to, into, to use the street space much better so they can have bicycle lanes and they can have a new tram line or light rail line uh, linking the university with the city. They can move students in to live in the city. So we come to the end that a sustainable city, that's fine, but a people city will do more. And I think that should always be the aim that we make people cities because in that way we can address smartly many of the things we are to address in our side. I know that the major problem is not earthquake Christchurch or it's not New York, it's not Copenhagen, whatever. The major problems of our cities in the future are in the developing countries. And I will just end by returning to Mrs. Khan in, in Vietnam and hoping that eventually we can make cities all over the world where the children can be part of the cityscape. Thank you very much.